Hello, my name is Warrior Boswell and this is The Measurables. Today we are joined by a friend of mine and yours, a gentleman who spent 40 years crafting the image of what American design and how we should dress. The fashion guy then became the creative director. Talking about none other than Mr. Jim Moore. How are you? Wow, thank you for that introduction. <laughs> I don't know if I deserve that. Good to see Absolutely. you. Absolutely, good yeah. to see you as thank well. Thank you for having me here. So before we get into the litany of things that I want to discuss with you, how are you? What's new? How am I? What's new? I'm good. I'm good. I'm in a in a uh, kind of relaxed state right now because I'm a little bit on. Uh, I'm, I took some some time off as Absolutely. I often do in July. Yeah, I, I'm, I've I've kind of been this way all my life. Where if everyone goes away in August, I don't want to go away. And if everybody, you know, Absolutely. If, and if everybody's working in July, then that's when I want to go away. You know, I've always if I if I can swing it, uh, I would be the person going to Greece and. October, not in that. August, you know. Yes, so uh, yes. that's just that's just kind of my thing. But I am I'm wrapping it up this weekend and then back to Brooklyn to uh, to get do back some into shoots. it. Yeah, to get yeah. back into but it. Life is good. Absolutely. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you for asking. We, I mean, we, you know, we we had a conversation prior to the cameras rolling. Yes. And uh, you know, you just you know kind of blessed me with some you know real information, and like you know we 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 always have these conversations on the phone, but the fact that we're having it in person, it just like elevates the importance of it. Well, I'm super honored to be here Absolutely. and to be face to face because it's been pre pandemic since we've actually yeah. been in the same room. Absolutely. You were so gracious to come to my book signing party mm -hmm. and uh, here out in LA. Yeah. And it was lovely to see you and meet your wife and yes. you know have kind of a chill moment, uh, just really beautiful always to be inspired by you and mm -hmm. your incredible presence and your incredible style thank you brother and uh yeah i i like i like being around good people you're good people thank you very much so like after you depart and you set off and you chart this new path like you know what is the what's the 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 focal point in terms of like what you're going to do next if you have that already like laid out or was it like, you know what, I stopped on Friday, Monday, I'm going to take and go do this, or I'm going to take a year off, or actually, I know exactly what I'm going to do. Right. Well, you know, it, it, it kind of unfolded really naturally in a way. I mean, I have mm -hmm. to say the minute that, you know, Condé Nast started doing this restructuring and, you know, there was a possibility that, you know, I could go more of a freelance player absolutely you know, after being full-time for so long mm -hmm. way in the back of my mind listen i i could stay at gq forever i love that job but mm -hmm. in the back of my mind and in the pit of my soul or maybe not that far down was always this person saying you nailed it there absolutely hopefully you know absolutely uh, because i had an amazing team yeah but i uh can i have a chapter two and what would that be what would that look like so mm -hmm. i think that was always kind of swirling around but but because you know the magazine business is so hectic mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that you know i started when i was 19 at gq so i was kind of born into that culture absolutely of like every three and a half weeks you turn out another magazine and you can't you know, if your friends come to you and say like, oh, in, you know, the first week of August in 2023, we want to go to Greece, you know, mm -hmm. there's no way I know what I'm doing next week, let alone mm -hmm. in 2023. Absolutely. Right. So it annoys, uh, you know, people that are around me that I can't just pick up and go. But the schedule has always been kind of dictated by the by the magazine and the celebrities we shoot and the projects. And that worked really well for me because I grew up in that culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people, I've had assistants that <clears throat> are phenomenal assistants, but after a while they're like, I can't, this is too much of a circus. I it's can't. too hectic. It's too hectic. And yeah. in a way, I, in my mind, I felt that it was very structured, you know, because it was this kind of dance you had to do and you had these, you had these three and a half weeks and you had to be topical. Deadlines. So you had to, so yeah. you knew as the deadline came, you were going to be shooting 
closest to deadline for the mm -hmm. most part. And then you've got to think about the next three issues, right? right? So it's always this kind of like moving target. And it doesn't matter how many calendars you have in front of you, it changes every single day. Wow. I think I'm kind of built that way to start mm -hmm. with. So it, it served me well. So I think the idea that, you know, now I'm going to step out of the nest and I'm going to have this kind of unstructured life. That's right? what I'm saying. I, I would think that'd be very difficult. It'd be <laughs> like, very difficult. What is that going to be about? But, you know, I kind of, I kind of attacked it the same way I did when I moved to New York and set my eyes on working for GQ. I said, I've got to meet with everybody. It's almost like it, in my mind, it was like, let's start over, right? Let's, mm. let's make, let's make chapter two, like a new chapter. Like I know pretty much everyone in menswear, but let's, let me arrange coffees, lunches, mm. you know, dinners with people I know. So I probably right. did well over a hundred meetings with companies. This is post GQ. This is post GQ. So wow. I kind of jumped, you know, I was still under contract, but I was no more, I was no longer obligated to that, that very hectic schedule. Right. I had big blocks of time. And for the first probably four to five months, I just, that was my full-time job. Just like calling up. Reacclimating yourself to the territory. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Every, everything from, you know, everybody from Ralph Lauren to Amazon to like whatever it was, you know, that I needed to, uh, to do to just say, hey, whether you know it or not, I am a gun for hire, you know? Absolutely. And this is what I think I could do for you. In, in reference to your wardrobe. Yes. For the most part, it's mainly dark hues. For the most yes. part. Yes. Is there a science or a psychology to that Einstein wardrobe, or that's just like, you know what? I've just, I've, I've been doing this forever. You know, Mark Anthony Green, mm -hmm. who works at GQ? Yes. He came in my office once, he's like, I figured it out. I was like, Mag, what have you figured out? He's like, you have to earn your wardrobe. You have to earn the uniform. Wow. And you earned it, and that's why you dress the way you are, dressed. Yeah. And, I don't know if I believed all of what he said, but I thought it was kind of amazing because hmm. it is true when you're, especially if you're a fashion guy or girl like you and I, it's like you go through these phases, right? Mm -hmm. You go through the experimental phase when you yeah. want to wear, you know, all the colors, Peacock. all the stuff, it's right? Nice. Yeah. And, and you go through maybe a vintage phase and then you go through like, let me mix this with this. And along the way, I get so inspired by photographers I would work with or actors or athletes or whatever that mm. that that kind of all of that kind of put in a Cuisinart started to develop my own personal style mm -hmm. and what made me the happiest was when I had a uniform mm -hmm. and I remember going to Margiela in Paris this was years ago when Margiela was at the head of the Maison and I saw everybody in lab coats and I was like, how great must that be Absolutely. to be in a lab coat? Everyone's I uniform. love going to fast food restaurants and seeing everybody in a uniform, mm -hmm. you know, that's not so much right. anymore, but right. or like flight attendants. And I thought, that's kind of great. I never went to a private school. Obviously, I couldn't, my parents couldn't afford it, but I did like the idea of a uniform. And I thought to myself one day, it, it wasn't a, I, I just think I like the idea of like wearing black and making myself a little bit of a lab technician in a way, mm. you know, because right. what we do, we're always in a laboratory, right? Absolutely. You're always looking at swatches for your beautiful collection. You're right. always fitting your uh, customers. Mm -hmm. You are always playing with shapes and things. That's a, mm. that's a laboratory really. Absolutely. And it's not for me to look like a peacock to make someone else look Grade. It's for me to kind of disappear and have this simple wardrobe that's going to be comfortable, yeah. but suit me. And then I can make the person I'm dressing look great. And, uh, and the, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of an easy thing, you know, but I still get excited about buying another black polo or, you know, yeah. a pair of New Balance or whatever it is. My next question is, so Lou Wasserman, I, there, there, there's a, a documentary on him, on okay. how he ran Hollywood and, yes. you know, pretty much took you know, the company MCA from where it was as a management company and just made it. And his guy, who was like his consigliere in Washington, D.C., said that he had the all-seeing eye, right? Jim Nelson said that you have the eye. Hmm. What does that mean to you? What does the eye mean? The eye is probably the ability to 
react quickly to creative um, situations, mm. problem solving very quickly. And that's the that's the work of work. That's the that's the job of working for a magazine. Because and being on those deadlines, we'll be in a we'll be in an ideas meeting, and maybe we're in there for an hour and a half, and then we've decided that we're going to put LeBron James on the cover, right? Mm -hmm. And the last person that Jim is going to look to in the meeting is going to be me, and he's going to say, "Now, how should we dress him?" You know, right? So it's something instinctually that I think about that I could see him at. Obviously, it's based a little bit on how we might have shot him the year before or mm -hmm. four years before and kind of where we are in the, you know, in the in fashion the landscape. Right. Uh, landscape. But I think it's, I think what trips up a lot of creative people, I've actually said this before, but what trips up a lot of creative people is that they have so many ideas in their mind and you have to just, at some point you just have to just pick one, right? Correct. And you just have to say like, I see LeBron in. Correct black leather jacket and the turtleneck or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think we should shoot him, you know, in a beautiful, you know, forest or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like you just, I get a vision and then I say it and then I make sure that I stick to it. Absolutely. And if for some reason, uh, LeBron James won't go to forest or for some reason he won't wear a black turtleneck, I will still keep an essence of that idea. Uh, even if we end up in a studio, you know? Absolutely. So I think that, the eye probably has a little bit to do with that. It also has a lot to do with training. I worked, um, before I even got to GQ, I worked at Paul Stewart, mm -hmm. which is a pretty reputable mm -hmm. conservative men's store, but considered a little bit more, um, I don't know, more experimental than a Brooks Brothers. Absolutely. Especially in the, in the late 70s. And, you know, I learned a lot of things there. I learned how to fit a glove on a man's hand. I learned how to... Uh, take a fedora and place it on a man's hand and, and put, put the crease and fold down the brim. And, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like I'm lucky because I had a lot of mentors along the way that, that taught me those things. And I was just curious as a cat. So I was yes. I had a voracious appetite for fashion magazines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was no internet in those days. So you really had to kind of buy them all and look through them. And, yes. and that's kind of how I, I, I charted my course because I... I, I, I wanted to be a, a fashion editor, but I didn't know what I didn't really know what they did. But I I knew that someone was on set to make sure that person, whether it's a guy or a girl, Whoa. looked great. That mm -hmm. worked with the photographer to make sure the light was great. That worked with the setting. That there was someone who had had the eye, right? Mm -hmm. And I could, over time, looking at different magazines or books or whatever, I could see that people had different different eyes and different visions. And I became um, you know, a little bit self-educated on it. And then when I got to New York, I just kind of went, I went and I was just became this giant sponge and I just, just kind of took it all in. But, you know, I was very lucky to have some very talented, creative, stylish people around me when I was very young. Absolutely. So speaking of your, uh, just your vision, I remember when Rachel Johnson reached out to me and she was like, you know, I, I, I have something I want to share with you, but you need to come see me where I am. And I was at home and she's, I said, well, where are you? And she was at this hotel on Sunset. And um, she said, when you get to the lobby, just give me a call, come down. So I get to the lobby, call her naturally. She comes down and she's like, how are you? I'm like, Rachel, like, you got me out here. Like, what do you need? Yeah. And she's like, would you be interested in dressing Colin Kaepernick? And like, I was just like, wow, of course. Mm -hmm. And she was like, don't say yes so quick. We need it in 48 hours. And I was like, okay. So it was that there, there, there were three suits that were made. And speaking to your eye, there was one black and white suit that had more of a tribal feel to it. Yes. And I remember I, I was calling her every like every five minutes because I wanted to be there, but it was a closed set. She was just like, well, the black suit's not going to work. What other suit do you have? And I was like, well, we can do a black suit. And she was like, all right, send that. And when, I, I guess when it arrived, you know, you put your eyes on it and you're like, this will work. Right. But the, 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 the question I have for you, because I wasn't there, was when, when, when he put on something that was more tribal, how did you land at the, 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 the Black Panther-esque look? Because it, it, it worked so perfectly, just being so stripped down and it just be about his eyes, about right. his natural. And then, and, and then we get to the clothes. Like, how did you arrive there? 
Uh, again, that was something that happened pretty quickly. You know, I, I had worked with Colin, and we were up in San Francisco, and we were shooting him, right, San Francisco? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I remember seeing his, his hair, how it had evolved and changed, and he had gone natural, and, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, that has obviously a little bit of a retro vibe to it, and it reminded me of, you know, my childhood watching movies in the 70s, and I thought that would be great, and I thought it would very, be very respectful to him and his causes. Absolutely. And uh, Rachel is someone who I absolutely adore. She's one of my dearest friends. We have mm -hmm. a really exciting project mm -hmm. that we're working on. Mm -hmm. um, that you'll be the first to know about. Absolutely, but, yes. Uh, she, she's someone who, you know, when you work in the magazine business, you don't, it, it's changed a little bit, but fashioners don't necessarily welcome in outside stylists all Agreed. the time. Agreed. Right? Agreed, yes. We, we want their advice if because they shoot, you know, obviously they know what looks best or they worked with them or the certain designers or whatever. Mm -hmm. Rachel and I, we just hit it off right away. And she was like, when you come down, it was a LeBron James cover, which was uh, um, the first one we did with LeBron. And, you know, she's like, when we go to Cleveland, you'll see the closet that I set up for him. And like, we just hit it off like a house on fire. So every time there was someone that she was her client that I would invite her into the shoot, and we would do it together. That's so amazing. that was really um, kind of a, a a new swerve for us, you know, right. Be, but because I felt that she had such great uh, taste and such great relationships mm -hmm. and she loved the magazine, you know, right. and she kind of became, you know, for lack of a better word, like a freelance, you know, yes. she became part of the family. Absolutely. So, you know, I'll always, kick myself she'll always kick herself but 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 it came you know with a great you know a surprise and a and a prize at the end it was that colin said you know rachel and jim i really would love to be dressed by des by designers of color mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and let's include women in there as well that's amazing and it was like that? that is so i'm just getting goosebumps right now mm -hmm. that is fantastic that is like you know it's like why didn't we think of that you know right. so right. it was a moment where we were um it was an unprecedented moment because there were a lot of designers that probably you know up until that point even though i f i feel that we were we had opened our arms to you know uh every community i felt like a lot of those designers had never seen the inside of the gq closet absolutely you know? yeah and uh here were designers that I may have known about, but didn't know a lot about them. And it was a real learning experience. Colin, uh, our conversations with Collins, who's, a, who's a, is incredibly charismatic, sweet, obviously hyper uh, smart, hypersensitive uh, man on a mission, was the first person to teach me about Black Lives Matters. This is mm -hmm. back in 2017. And uh, we proceeded with the shoot. So it was a combination of like, all these things. All these things. You know, like, let's dress you like this. We had to go to an undisclosed location because it was a real top secret thing. And right. everyone was super pumped that we were doing this right. for men of the year. But, you know, it was that extra. It was Colin really saying, like, could this be possible? It wasn't a demand. He was like, is this something that would interest you? It was like, right away, it was like, boom. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. This, is, this yeah. is incredible. And so deserved of, of men of the year. Uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So you've worked with... Uh, Ava Don and Mizell mm -hmm. and Bruce. Do you look at these photographers like a parent looks at their children? Like you can't choose one. Like they're all good for different reasons. Or do you say, you know what? Well, if I'm if, if I'm doing something outdoors, I'm gonna go to this guy. If I'm right. doing something that's situational, I'm gonna go to, 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 to this woman. I think it's the same reason why people come to you for mm -hmm. um to be dressed the way you're dressed because right. you have a signature look that they're interested right. in, right? right? So oftentimes, if I mentor a young photographer, um, a, lot of, a lot of photographers, especially in the beginning, they are very eager to tell you that they can do anything, right? And I was like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to know that you can do anything. I want to know that you can only you what I need signature you signature look. Right. Well, no, but I want you to have a signature look. Right. I don't care if it's like I take pictures you know, on soccer fields only, or I only do black and white portraits, mm -hmm. or I only do this. 
that is going to get you farther than, oh, I can shoot still lives and I can shoot black and white and I can shoot right. landscape. Then there's nothing, there's no reason to hire you because you're right. just, right? So right. that I learned very early on, you have to have a signature. You mm -hmm. know, if you're a creative person, you have to have a signature. Your clothes have a signature, hopefully mm -hmm. the way I style and creative direct has a signature and photographers, especially of the caliber of a Testino or a Mizell or mm -hmm. an Avedon, they have a, a signature that when you think of them and you think of the subject and you think of your idea, which is an editorial idea, it's just, well, that's magical. We have to get, you know, we have to get Steve Mizell for this or we have to get Bruce Weber for this. Right. You know, we have to, if we're shooting Tom Brady and he's, you know, about to, you know, win his third Super Bowl ring and we want it to be really special and, you know, want to spend a whole day with him, then we're going to, let's take him to Florida and work with, with Bruce, you know. So that's amazing. It's, it's a... It's a discussion. Obviously, it's a creative discussion within within the magazine, and mm -hmm. you know, it would be led by Jim Nelson and myself and the photo director, and we would kind of just hash it out. But I was pretty headstrong about who I wanted to work with, and luckily, Jim backed um, you one hundred percent. Backs me one hundred percent, and really loved great photography. You know, mm. I think I think the thing that kind of goes underrated sometimes is the skill set of an editor in chief who their main skill set is to hire the best people right. for each category. So if right. Jim Nelson, you know, knows a lot about, you know, topical commentary and knows a lot about politics and he knows a lot about um, journalism, but maybe he doesn't know a lot about sports. Maybe he doesn't know about, a lot about fashion. It's the mm -hmm. inner chief's job to hire the best people for that. And then, and then learn from those people and then, you know, it's kind of he sits in the middle and these people are all around him like a satellite, you know. So yeah. Jim was a fast learner, you know. He spent his, I remember he spent his first couple months at the magazine uh, in the fashion department. And he's like, I need to know what you guys do back here. Wow. And I was, you know, I loved the idea that he really embraced and, and to come wanted down to, to his make hands. it more fashion and wanted yeah. to talk directly to the guys and wanted to teach them more. And wanted to do a lot of storytelling. So he came back and, you know, nothing, no stone was unturned with Jim. If you, if you said in passing, like, well, uh, you know, that's in the, you know, Fear of God lookbook or whatever. He would be like, wait, what's a lookbook? You know, and then you'd have to show him examples of it. Right. And he, he wanted to learn. So it was, it was a very interesting time because, and he was a fast learner and he, and he you know, he's, he was at the magazine for six years before, so it was nice to have a contemporary um, get the job, and well, also someone who you know had had great taste and was super smart. And as it. most as most editor in chiefs and creative directors is always looking for the thing that's not in the room, right. or the thing that's not up on the wall. Right. If you've right. ever seen the September issue, mm -hmm. it's not that far from like all the magazines, you mm -hmm. know, like. The, the 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 story comes the pictures come in too early and they sit around too long it kind of, mm -hmm. be, kind of they kind of right. become like oh yeah we've got that story but what do what what don't we have or right. what what's coming in you know so oh. it's it's the it's why magazines have to come out every month because right. the material gets it's dated uh, gets dated it gets know? dated so speaking for me specifically whenever I meet people who I find fascination with or have like you know just been people that I've looked to in pivotal moments of my life, when I actually meet them in person, I always tell them that. So like when I met Sidney Poitier, I was like, thank you. And he said, for what? I said, for your contribution. When I met, you know, Dikembe Mutombo, I was like, thank you. He was like, for what? I was like, you know, for just making defense just as important as offense. Like he made the block shot, like he would wave his finger. I'm asking you this, well, I'm, I'm, I'm relaying this message to you because you, along with GQ, are responsible for like shaping how men dress in the United States. And since the United States is kind of like the beacon, a lot of times for like what a lot of things become, do you have people who come up to you the same way I came up to Sidney Poitier or Dikembe and say, thank you, Jim, for this? Mm -hmm. or I appreciate you for that. Like, does mm -hmm. that happen in your everyday life? Like, are you at Whole Foods and, you know, somebody just rolls yeah. up? Yeah, it does, actually. And where did it happen recently? I was with a friend of mine, and we were, I think we were in Brooklyn, and this guy was just, like, came up to me, and he was like, 
this young black kid who had great style mm-hmm. and simple style, but really well put together, mm-hmm. you know? So my eyes kind of went on like, you know, I'm always checking out the sneakers and the relationship with the sock and everything mm-hmm. and kind of eyes in the back of my head person all the time, almost mm-hmm. like uh, too overly observant, too much so sometimes. Mm-hmm. And um, he was like, I just want to thank you for everything you've done for me wow. and my style and what you've done for American men. And it was, it was kind of like... Um, the person I was with is like, well, that almost sounded like a sign off in a way. <laughs> and I said, no, it actually happens more than you think. And it'll happen. It, it'll happen in a cosmopolitan situation. So it mm-hmm. will happen if I'm at the Westfield mall over here, or it'll happen if I'm in Brooklyn or it'll yeah, happen yeah. like, because it'll happen wherever stylish guys are. And I think maybe something that he was talking about is the idea that, you know, American men are, or men in general in America have an insecurity about, style you know mm-hmm. and i think that's from young a from lot. young from yes. young absolutely and i don't know i mean your wife is so beautiful and so stylish you, and you are so handsome and so stylish Thank i feel you were like born with this gift right whether you were or not um but i think most guys they want it but they don't know how to get it but if they get the compliment they wear that olive green, which looks beautiful with their eyes or their skin tone or what they're wearing. It opens them they up. They get a compliment that opens them up. It gives them confidence. Right. So if you keep feeding them that and you keep telling them in an authentic way wow. that this is the color you should be wearing, this is the cut of jean you should be wearing, you should never wear, yeah. you know, ripped jeans, the office or whatever it is, right. then you're you're a confidence builder, right? You're yeah. not. You're an image maker, yes, with celebrities and athletes, but you're a confidence builder to the average wow. guy. And you can be all that at once. And, and, you know, men don't naturally have the chip that a lot of women do, not to separate men and women, Correct. but a lot of women, you know, they know how to go to um, Prada and then go to Zara and then go to Target Probably and mix it all up and it looks Absolutely. great, right? Absolutely. And they just, and men are just like. Preaches a habit. Yeah. So if you tell him this, if you tell a guy, this is the, this is the suit you should wear. This is the brand you should wear because the mm-hmm. button stands is perfect on you. The lapel is great. The shoulders fit you up. Mm-hmm. They'll put down their plastic and go deep. Correct. Right? Within, Correct. they're loyal. They're actually loyal consumers. Hyper loyal. They'll actually spend more money than women. Mm-hmm. But it's like they need someone. To push. To push. And you're and, that. Yeah. And I, I think that. I think that I think the table. I think it's changed a lot. I think there's a lot of guys that and we can we can thank um, we can thank designers like Virgil. Mm-hmm. We can thank uh, a lot of uh, Ralph. We can thank Ralph. We can thank Tom Ford. We can thank all those people yeah. because they're aspirational, right? Mm-hmm. And they're also, um, you know, guys will they'll want to have that look, but they don't know quite how to do it. So I try to go out of my way, even if no one calls me out for a video they might have seen or whatever. If I see someone doing something right, I always go up to them and tell them. I was like, those shoes are great. If I'm in a store and they're trying, they're debating whether they should get that camel coat or not, camel coat looks great on you. Absolutely. Go for a size up, it'll look cooler, you know, whatever. And they'll, and all of a sudden they like, they stand in front of the mirror a little yes. bit taller, you know, yes. because someone's complimented them on it. And Absolutely. That, and that's, that's the deal breaker with, with a lot of guys. But I think because of streetwear and I think because of the fact that um, sky's the limit a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's a good thing and a bad thing. But I think, yeah. it, I think a, lot of, a lot of younger people have a little bit more innate style than, than um, because, there's, because the rules have been broken or abolished. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, but I'm still happy when I read in the business of fashion that, you know. Suits are doing well, but they're being worn in a different way or whatever. Right, because right. No one's saying that we need to go back to suits and ties and tie bars because that, that was an era. But the fact that, you know, there's nothing better than a guy in a piece of tailored mm-hmm. clothing. Mm-hmm. And, and tailored Absolutely. clothing can be what you're wearing, which is a beautiful kimono jacket. It right. can be a military jacket like I'm wearing. It doesn't have to be a three-piece suit. But right. Um, to have a little bit of structure um, is something that I think always looks good on a guy. So. Absolutely. So... Growing up reading a magazine, I would never like it, it, it was it was very rare that I would see a black designer featured in the pages. I, I mean, like the Ozzy Smith cover. I remember that. Yeah. Like, I remember the Jordan cover, mm-hmm. that picture of him holding the ball. Like, I mean, like, like, yeah. I mean, vividly. So, like, when I was able to meet with you, I believe we met in 2000, maybe five or six. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. Like it was like stepping into the empire for real because like I just hadn't like I'm from Pasadena. I mean, like this little small town, like to be meeting with you in New York at the Condé Nast office was just like amazing. My question to you is, at what point in those rooms that you were in, did you all say, you know what? We have to make, or, or, or I, I guess the better question is, was it a concerted effort to say, you know what, this landscape is more than Anglo. We got to like include some other designers and tell different points of view. And was MAG a result of that? Or was that something that had already been brewing in those rooms prior to MAG even getting there? Mark Anthony Green. I think there was a, there was a, a, a lack of African-American designers. I don't think, I think it was, you know, I don't think we had set our sights strongly enough on finding them, but it's mm -hmm. like, I feel, um, so anyways, I have this mentorship that I've told you about that, mm -hmm. I, that I do Absolutely. with Rachel. Yes. And the thing that amazed me, because I, I just, I'm constantly blown away by how uh, inventive and how authentic the designers are that we, we, um, mentor and some of them are photographers, some of them are creative directors, some of them are stylists. Right. But if I just talk about the designers for a minute, a lot of them are not just out of the box, you know, they haven't gotten that break. Uh, it's, it, you know, and they have, it's amazing when you, do you know Rich Fresh? Of course. So I've known him forever when mm -hmm. he was just, you know, buying everything with credit cards and not mm -hmm. like you know, being able to make it. He had something so authentic that I was like, this story has to be told. Right. Or, you know, Prep Curry mm -hmm. or uh, my guy, um, Mike Paul up in Toronto that does mm -hmm. beautiful clothing. And, yes. you know, these guys have been held back for so long that a lot of them have been doing it for a long time. They weren't right. given the break on Correct. season on season one or season two. Correct. And that, in a way, I think is, yes, that's, that's, that's definitely our bad, in a lot of ways, but in a way, I don't think, I think the whole industry has to kind of be accountable for it, for not like putting, putting a, a, a marginalized community front and center because right. the, the creativity and the, the things I'm seeing are just, it's mind blowing. And I don't know if you know Prep Curry's story about um, him going to a Banana Republic party and saying, mm -hmm. meeting the CEO and yes. saying, I should be doing a collection for you, you know? Yes. and. I try to encourage people and tell that story all the time when I'm talking to black designers, um, people of color, Asian designers, females, you know, be bold, you know, be bold Absolutely. and be fearless. And, you know, yeah. the fact, the fact that you never felt like you could be is, is, is heartbreaking. You know, it's like, sometimes I get very, I get very emotional a lot about this, about this mentoring program. Mm -hmm. Because I realize that someone who has been struggling a lot longer than their white counterpart, mm -hmm. and that is very disturbing. Absolutely, it's very disturbing to yeah. someone to someone who, you know, I pride myself on going to every trade show, looking under every rock for every yeah, kind I got of the trend receipt, or yeah, designs I, I, or whatever. I, yeah, absolutely, I, that's what I love to do. And people ask me all the time, like, why are you still going to the trade shows? Or why are you doing this? It's like, well, that's what we do, you know? It's absolutely. like, because it's not, yes, we love the, the, the Ralphs and the Calvins of the world, but it's like, it's, you know, the next generation. It's a bigger is, world out there. Is a bigger world. So thankfully things are changing and anything I can do to help, I'm, I'm on board. Absolutely. So yeah. there is a specific way that GQ has shot and it has a lot to do with the jump and capturing the, 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 jump. the model. Okay. Like, like, you know, the, the models are jumping and then you all catch them in midair. Like what is the genesis of shooting like that versus like, you know, just your regular run of the mill, like, like who, whose idea was it like, you know, let, let, let's capture these, these models and these clothes in action. Is that something that, that, that you birthed or like, where did that come from? You talking about basketball players? Or are you talking about? No, just, just like, just, just any models. Like there are so many, well, I want, I, I want to share something with you. When I okay. started doing my collection in 2002, okay. 2002, I had these books, 2002. That's these crazy. books. So if you look right behind you, all the, like all, all those folders there. Yes. They're full of these. Oh, that's amazing. 
And it's, I mean, like, like, like. This like, goes back to 2002? This goes back to, wow. back, back to 2002. And it's, it's just, it's just all of these different things that I would see in all these magazines, mm-hmm. predominantly GQ. Yeah. And it, 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 it would always be, you know, like, I, I had them separated on purpose. So I knew specifically, like, you know, how I wanted to style my, mm-hmm. my sweaters. Right. What to wear with my, you know, my, 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 my khakis or whatever, like. All, like was this all for your personal style specifically or as a designer? So, so literally it started as my own personal Bible. Okay. But then as I started to design, I was like, you know what? I, like if, if I want to know, if I want motivation on, you know, what a motorcycle jacket should look like, what yeah. those basic elements are, like I had to separate them. So like in my apartment, my apartment was maybe like 500 square feet, but I had, I would buy all these magazines and I would and, and I would literally cut all these things out, and I would have like the, these are the jackets, these are the pants, these are the socks, these are the hats, and I would do this. And from this, it's a magazine. It's its own magazine. Yeah, look at this. F- from this birthed, you know, War Air. But all, but like like all of this is is like literally the genesis of like me going through your work. And so there will be you know what ten jeans to buy. But it would be a man like jumped up in the air and he's like, he's like suspended midair. Mm-hmm. And like that was something that I wasn't seeing in all these other magazines. It was something I was only seeing in GQ. Right. So I want to know, like, did you all intentionally do this? Or like, was it just like, oh, you it, it was like, like, you know, the, the model jumped and you all caught it and like saw it and was like, oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, you probably heard the term very GQ, right? Very so that's GQ. Some, that's something that it, I mean, that's something it, I coined many years ago, and I think consciously, unconsciously, I think you know when you are, um, you know, there's a certain look to Vogue, you know, there's a certain mm-hmm. look to GQ, mm-hmm. and you know, during my time that I was there, well, let me tell you, there's a, there was a there's a very high level executive at Condé Nast who I showed my book to very first. You probably guess who it is. And um, this person looked through my book and really responded to the joy in the book. Hmm. Right. And hadn't remembered right. seeing so much joy. And it was kind of, there was a little bit of an epiphany with this person saying that this is what really sets GQ apart. This is what right. makes it very GQ. Right. right. And, you know, the buck stops here with me because I am a stickler, a little bit of a barracuda for, you know, whether it was chrome film or standing in front of the monitor is, is you know, pushing the photographer to get the image that I, I felt was right for the magazine. Right. Giving them a long leash so they could do what they did. But, you know, lots of communication. And, you know, if the photographer is like, well, we've been shooting hundreds of images we must have it i'll be like i haven't gotten goosebumps yet i haven't seen the frame keep shooting Just keep getting it yeah right so i i'm hmm. i won't give i'm a stubborn Taurus, so i'm not going to give up until i see that cover i'm not going to give up until i right. see that you know if anything you know talk to a celebrity they might be a little bit exhausted after one of my shoots because i'm like let's try a different outfit for the cover and <laughs> let's bring back three great covers and right you know i think that's just kind of what we did but i think you know joy can be corny so it's like that moment when joy looks cool or joy looks chic or it it achieves what we're trying to do because we don't want you know five guys across the spread just standing there looking blue steel right um that's that's the moment that i love and you know there's a lot of peggy sirota in this book who i worked with for you know 25 years and Mm -hmm. she i kept going back to her for certain celebrities that i thought needed to be poked a little bit wow. or wow. celebrities that I knew like the rock who had an inner child that we could have fun with. Right. Mm-hmm. So we're always looking for that joy. We're always looking for, um, whether it be a cover or a fashion story, you know, I remember Jim Nelson said it best once, uh, in the very beginning when he came aboard, I was like, what are you looking for in a cover? And I don't think I ever asked him that question again. I just knew, you know, what, what to was. bring home. He said, right. um, I just want the person to look like they want to be there That's and I right. want presence and yeah. I want intent. And I also, in those days, newsstand sales were very important. So you wanted to create an image that really popped off the newsstand. 
Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. it doesn't matter. You can shoot someone from behind or out of focus or whatever because the sense of yeah. don't matter, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. The caliber of celebrity matters, and your your digital numbers are more important than your print numbers. But mm-hmm. in those days, it was, you know, they had to have that. You know, I had to love the picture. Jim had to love the picture. We had the guy had to or the girl had to feel like they were having a good time on that cover. Absolutely. And that was part of that was part of the joy. That was part of the the lifestyle, you know. It was a it, at the end of the day, um you know, Ralph Lauren invented that term lifestyle, you know, back in the 70s when he started in the 80s when he did his campaigns were less about the clothes, they were more about, you know, the world, the world, the right? world that I'm showing you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, whether it was, you know, Tyson Beckford, you know, just leaning against a green wall, but you knew he was at a tennis court, right? Or a family, you know, mm-hmm. sprawled out on wicker furniture, whatever mm-hmm. it was. And I think, you know, that's what Bruce kind of brought to GQ in the early, early days, brought this idea of lifestyle that it's not so much about like, a close-up on the white shirt, it's more about, like, let's put that white shirt in a place where it's really going to look Absolutely. It's best. Absolutely. It's best. And speaking of that, and I think I mentioned in the book, photographer, Bruce Weber specifically was someone who very early on taught me the trick that, you know, dress the model or dress the celebrity a little bit early, even have them horse around a little bit in the clothes to become their own. Mm-hmm. Let the wrinkles become like the white of. shirt was not just the white shirt. Yeah, we let to drag it a little bit. Let the let the clothes be you know you know part of the storytelling and and make sure the person looks like they're you know make sure the guy doesn't look like he's wearing this the, the suit's wearing him right right and a lot of times we would um, uh, especially if we were doing things that were more active like if we were doing a soccer story or if we were doing something that was a little bit more playful Mm -hmm. we would get them dressed a little bit early and have them horse around and then you know and then start taking pictures wow that that's a that was part of the the kind of lifestyle and then when jim when jim came on board he was art kind of did away a little he didn't do away with the lifestyle art was more about Art loves love movies, so mm-hmm. there were a lot of reenactments of like very cinematic tone, very cinematic. Absolutely. Like let's reenact, you know, these scenes from a, from a Woody Allen movie, right. you know, or right. Casablanca, right, or, mm-hmm. or North by Northwest, or he loved Cary Grant, and that was at that time that was a very cool thing to do, right? And then mm-hmm. that, then there was a moment that that didn't become, you know, Jim Nelson came in and said like, you're talking, you're explaining this white shirt like it's the best white shirt in the world, so let's. Let's put this white shirt on a pedestal and take a, mo- a really beautiful picture of it, and then and then do call outs and say, "This you is know, what makes it. This is what makes it. Pearl buttons, single needle tailoring, whatever it is, the collar, right. certain height." He right. was like, "Let's get let's get nerdy the details, about this." Yeah, the academics of, exactly. of the garment. When I was six five mm-hmm. and couldn't find any clothes, and this is before fast fashion, you know, it was very difficult for me, socially and professionally, to to to, to just be comfortable because I was so tall and I was gaunt and I was just like, I was just growing at an abnormal rate. Right. But once I started to make stuff for myself that fit me perfectly, there was a higher frequency that I was, that I was on yes. because I knew that I was presentable. Yes. So then it made it easy to then talk to whoever I want to talk to. Yes. Male or female. Yes. Do you feel that there is a true organic spiritual connection with clothing and the spirit when you look good? Yes, I don't think a lot of times guys know how to tap into that. Hmm. But they, I'll, I'll circle back to, you know, sorry for simplifying this so much, but I'll circle it back to like the way you feel when you look really great and the compliments you get. Right. I always tell people sometimes it's, sometimes it's the outfit that you throw on to run errands on a Saturday. That's really And some, sometimes it's like, hey, I just threw this together because I had to right. put some clothes on. And, right. You know? So there's there's kind of that. Or it's like, you know what? This is a special occasion. I am going to get this suit made for me. Or I am going to spend a little extra money. Or I'm going to buy this bag. is probably a couple hundred dollars more than I should spend. But, mm-hmm. boy, everybody is complimenting me on it. And that, I think that is in itself where fashion really does its job. You know, yeah, when it when it absolutely. when it gives you when it gives you excitement, but also you can integrate it into your life and you can start to develop your own personal style. Mm-hmm. Uh, your how long have you been designing clothes? Since two thousand two. So I'm twenty 2002. years. Two thousand two. Okay. 
20 years. And did it start, was it organic like that? It started from the fact that you didn't have yeah. anything to wear? It was, it was, it was literally, I mean, just very truly organic. I worked at United Talent and the writing was on the wall because all the people who were in the, in those training programs, predominantly from the Midwest and the East, mm-hmm. a lot of them went to Ivy League schools. If they weren't Ivy League schools, they were just, you know, highly touted institutions. Right. So me showing up and I'm a graduate of CSUN from a family rich in love, not necessarily finance, is like, like that gets me through the door. That's fine. But now there's that world, but then there's a world of how do you look because you're client facing, right? You're dealing mm-hmm. with actors, you're dealing with below the line people, mm-hmm. you're dealing with studios, you're dealing right. with all of these people. So what is your uniform? So I mentioned earlier in our interview, Lou Wasserman. Like yes. I'm like, I, 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 it, just knowing his story and how he crafted that uniform. Yes. Like I didn't know that he had crafted that uniform when I was working in the agency world. And so like to actually see that and then remember, okay, oh, Jeremy Zimmer, he only wore suits. Nick Stevens, mm-hmm. like, he like looked more like Jim Nelson did. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, it just all started to make sense. So I was like, you know, minority reporting all of this stuff, like, in real time. Right. So me having, like, I didn't stop growing until I was 29. So it was like, it, like by, by 29, for the most part, back, at, back in those days, you had to know that you were, like, close to your destination. Yes. Professionally, by yes. then. And I didn't know. Until like I left UTA, when we worked at Amon Ra Films with Wesley Snipes, and we had a studio deal that expired with Disney, and we all got these severance packages. Yeah. And from that severance package, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And my sister and my mother were like, you need to find something that you like to do that you can get paid at. But I didn't know anybody in the fashion industry. Right. No one. So I was literally downtown, walking into all these buildings, going up and down stairs, just like looking to meet somebody who could actually put something together that would fit me. Right. Right. So like now, like when I was younger, I would see like NBA clips of like guys who like, 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 well, let's take it away from basketball for a second. Like a guy like Kurt Flood, what he did for free agency. Mm -hmm. If Kurt Flood told, um, you know, uh, any of the baseball players that get paid 625 million, what his sacrifice was, they may not necessarily like understand his sacrifice. Right. But like when I tell people who are like my height, how difficult my process was when I mm-hmm. first started, they don't understand it. But when I got something that fit me, it just took things to a completely different level. Then I went back to UTA. I went back to all these places that I was employed at and I started doing stuff for like people of any height. And I make a shirt, then I make a jacket, then I make a pant. Right. Then I was making a whole wardrobe for them. Then they would introduce me to Ashton Kutcher. They would yeah. introduce me to Leo DiCaprio. They would introduce me to Will Smith. They yeah. would introduce me to like, and that like that's how it grew. That's but how amazing. it grew, how it grew in the athletic space was was I was doing stuff for this guy named John Sally and Steve Smith. Then I started doing stuff for Mari Stoudemire, and that's when I met Rachel. Mm-hmm. And then Rachel was like, I mean, at that time, Rachel had literally like she single handedly like masterminded the new era of like uh, post the Malice in the Palace. The yes. fight that happened in Detroit with Ron Artest and Ben Wallace. Right. When Commissioner David Stern said, that's it. No more long T-shirts, these corn rolls. That's it. Yeah. Rachel was just at the perfect point because she dressed LeBron mm-hmm. and made LeBron like, you know, that style guy that GQ came and covered. I don't know how many covers he's been on since then. Yeah. But like, Four, like, right? she, like, like she was like the, the impetus of all that happening. And it's just very interesting. Yeah, and she came in at that moment when, you know, I remember um uh who's who who's Mike's who is Michael Jordan's coach again? Phil Jackson. Before that. Doug Collins? He was the one who told Michael to wear suits and then everybody all the basketball players wanted to look like Mike. Wow. Right? So they go to the they want to go to the same tailor as Michael. Um, and then after a while, it's like, oh, no, I'm going to find my tailor in my own city. Region. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, right before Rachel steps in and GQ starts stepping in and the, 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 um, the locker room becomes the fashion gauntlet, right? Absolutely. Suddenly it's like, wait, 
I don't want to look like Michael Jordan, and I don't want to wear suits like Michael Jordan. I want to look my, like myself, exactly. right? Yes. And I love. I want to go to the fashion shows, and I want to wear. You know. So then, that's when it kind of really exploded. And mm -hmm. people always say to me, like, "Who are the most fun people to shoot?" And it's always basketball players because football players too. But it's like basketball players are just like they don't want to talk about three point lead from last night's game. They mm -hmm. care less. They have enough mm -hmm. people asking about that. They want to see me and they want to look at the clothes and exactly. they want to try everything on. Right. And it's just like, you know, kids in the candy store. It's my favorite, my favorite moment is to, um, is to shoot basketball players because mm -hmm. they get so excited and I'm not trying to stereotypify all basketball players love fashion. But for the most part, I think it, if you look at the trajectory, it started really with, Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that, that coach and uh, uh yeah. Michael Jordan and uh and grown from there and grown from there and um yeah well I love hearing your story and of how you became a fashion designer because I never knew I never knew that was your trajectory absolutely that's, my, a, that's a beautiful thing my uh, my 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 ultimate question for you is you know being uh, being a man who's accomplished so much and you know I mean just like a blink of an eye what what makes you excited now in terms of profession like you know what are what are those next things that people may not know about that they should know about one of my favorite things is to sit in a meeting with a bunch of corporate people from um big businesses and tell them something that i think is very obvious but they haven't thought of wow which is uh, why are our women's sales so great and our men's sales are not? Right. And that's my favorite place to be. Hmm. I would love, you know, just put me in that situation and I can talk about it forever, as you can tell, but also I like to be really actionable and I've had, I've been able to make some difference with, with companies, uh, big differences. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens a lot of times and if it's a European-based company, even more, they don't understand the American male. And they put them in the same hopper as the f American female customer, right? Or they put them in the same hopper as the European and Asian and you mm -hmm. know, Arab customer. And that becomes uh, the problem because your men's sales are off in America because you're not, you're not, your doing, you're not, you're not teaching them anything. Mm -hmm. You're not you're not merchandising for them mm -hmm. and you're not, you're not for lack of a better term, holding their hand, you know, and showing them how to do it. Right. You're just kind of putting the stuff on shelves and, you know, expecting them to shop like the, the women shop on this side of the store. Yes. And of course it's always going to fail unless Correct. you just give them a little bit of, of, of help and encouragement. Right. Um, wanted to ask you about, I mean, just, just something on a, on a more spiritual level, what brings you the most joy? What makes me the most happy? I have to say that the pandemic was a very interesting time for me because I am a go, go, go person, right? Mm -hmm. I don't really, I'm not a very relaxed person. I don't spend a lot of time <laughs> relaxing. I have a house on the desert right. and I use it occasionally, but not a lot. And during the pandemic, I would go for these really long walks, right? And every, as soon as the sun would go behind the mountain in Palm Springs, I would take these two hour long walks. Mm. And it was just by myself. And, you know, my partner is into meditation, spirituality. I was never someone to meditate. I don't take my phone with me. I don't put headphones on or anything. And I just, and that's my meditation, you know? So, and I, for the first time, I, I never knew a cactus bloomed or, you know, I didn't see, I never saw the colors in the mountains or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the fact that my eyes were open to something that I had never seen before um, was really inspiring to me. So now these walks have become very important to me. And, and you know, where during the pandemic, I was in a very meditative state because the world was kind of all in chaos. Now those walks I use for like um, my think tank. You know? Absolutely. And that's when the ideas come to me. So it's like, wow. I like being, um, I'm comfortable being very social and being very um, quiet as well. And I think that the pandemic was, was something, I didn't know if I could do it. You know, I didn't know if I could spend that much time kind of mm -hmm. alone. I was lucky enough to, to uh, you know, 
be out in the desert. So that was great. But I think it's just getting up and looking at each day as like something different and never pegging things, you know, Absolutely. never saying like, Oh, I'm going to do this shoot. And I know exactly how it's going to play out. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't want to, I don't want to get out of bed and be that person. You know, I want to be the person who's like, you know, how can we make this the best it can be? Or how can I disrupt that situation a little bit more? Absolutely. Like, I know we're all set on that color background and whatever. It's probably gonna look good, but it's like, if you just move the model to that wall, I think it's gonna look better. So for me, it's be, always being up for the creative challenge and just being just being awake as a, as a human and, and letting things come to you. Absolutely. And realizing the power of that, that Absolutely. it's all coming to you constantly. You're just, a lot of times you're, letting it bounce off of you or you're not accepting it. So absolutely, um, absolutely. Being, and just being grateful for, for a beautiful life. In your book, you have a, uh, a uh, interview between you and, and Kanye. Mm -hmm. um, what is the, uh, the, the benefit that you feel he's brought to fashion? I mean, he is, I mean, listen, I'm not a, I'm not a f fanboy of anybody. I never have right. been. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that is, but I just, you know, probably the closest I ever got to it was shooting President Obama, you know, because that was, a little, that yeah. was like, Incredible. and I got to shoot him twice, you know, I got to shoot him yeah. when he went into office and when he left office and right. it was an incredible moment. And I'm not saying I don't have a lot of goosebump moments, but for me, Con Kanye is my friend and he is above all my friend, but I see him as the most creative person that I've ever met. And I wow. feel like when I'm around him, I just open myself to all the possibilities. So we have these really long conversations about, you know, how, you know, why should, uh, why should uh, plastic plates just be for children or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk about it, but I, I can go really deep. I have a pretty long attention span and he is incredible because he is a, incredible listener he is mm -hmm. a he is dedicated to his friends and the people that he loves obviously he likes people who are you know um top of their field but he, more than that he's very kind he's very compassionate he'll never forget something you told him he often writes things down mm -hmm. and he is a true creative because he's not just a disruptor he's not just looking at how to change things he's a fully honest human being and that's yeah. where the misinterpretation comes from yeah because people are like, oh, he's this, no, he's that. No, no, you're actually judging him. It's mm. like he's just, he's being who he is. Right. You know? Absolutely. And he's, he's kind of a poster boy for that. It's just people can't, that's too hard for them to Absolutely. believe, you know? So, sorry, I, will, I could go on a rant about how no, much no. I love Kanye. Yeah. But um, he is, uh, yeah, he's the most creative person I know. And when you're with him, anything is, anything is possible, you know? I, I, I find sometimes that, our matchup is good because I can, when I worked on Yeezy with him, we could, um, a gap Yeezy. I could, I could kind of, you know, if he has 1700 things, I can say like, well, let's, let's pick these 20. I can right. help him with that. Right. You know? Right. And, he, and, and, you know, he's really, he's really good at that. He really listens and he really puts people around him who, who help him with that. So, Absolutely. Um, but he's, he's, he's absolutely incredible. And in reference to all of the covers, is there any cover that stands or any like celebrity? I, I know you mentioned Obama, but like, you know, it's, you've had everyone on the cover. I mean, everyone. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah, pretty much. Is, 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 is there anyone that you were like, oh my God, I can't believe like I'm here at this very moment in time? Yeah, I can tell you. It's funny, no one put it like that, but as soon as you said that, I got a vision. So I was shooting. Um, Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman for Rain Man. Mm -hmm. were, you, were you even born in Rain Man? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. I was like 11. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. Okay, so I it's with Herb Ritz, a mm -hmm. legendary photographer, unfortunately he's no longer with us. Yeah. And we were shooting it in a very simple Herb way. It was just like a white background and very bright strobe. And we had the idea was to just put, put them both on the cover for this movie that was coming out that, mm -hmm. you know. That's the other thing. It's like 
we see the movies before anybody else, and then we kind of judge whether they're going to be hits or not. So yeah. we saw this as a big hit. So they're both in tuxedos. And Tom Cruise was my second, no, it was my first Tom Cruise cover. And did seven, should we show him seven times for the cover? So it was my first of seven covers. And I remember I was tying his bow tie and I was thinking like, I'm tying the bow tie on Tom Cruise. And how cool is that? And right. cut to Obama, that, 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 that happened again. And, Amazing. You know, he, uh, the Obama story is just incredible because he, I didn't necessarily like what he was wearing. So he agreed to change, to change. but you can't really dress the president, you know, but you can, you can, <laughs> but you, you have, but you can say, what else do you have? Right. In how many so years do you have here? Four decades. Well, I mean, yeah. but yeah. he trumps me, you know, a million times, but it's, and he, he's just the, the, the swagger and the joy and the charisma and the, the power coming off that man. Just incredible. Incredible. Brother, I want to thank you for being here and, and taking time coming up in Palm Springs to just sit here and just share thoughts with me on measurables. This thank you very much. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank the you. The honor was mine. You got it. It's